Eventually, he gave the photos to the Sunday Times of Great Britain and told the newspaper what the photos showed. Before they were published, he was kidnapped. Pharmaceutical companies are keeping the vaccine research a secret. They're deciding how many vaccines get made, how much to charge for them, and who gets vaccinated. Hello, my name is Stanley Heller. Welcome to The Struggle. A growing number of haters have been burning down refugee camps. We reported on this happening in Greece some time ago. Now, unfortunately, it has happened in Lebanon with a Syrian camp being burned to the ground. Allahu Akbar, Shoya. Sit al alam fa'an in iroz. Next, a new White Helmets video showing contrasts this winter season. Comment about this indecency surely is not necessary. Here we have Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu giving an elbow bump to a man you may not be familiar with. His name is Jonathan Pollard. He was a U.S. Navy analyst who handed over a mountain of top secret information to his Israeli handlers. He was driven by ego and big money payments and a blind love for Israel. He was given a sentence of life in prison, but was paroled after 30 years. Last November, Trump's parole commission decided to end the travel restrictions on Pollard. He came to Israel on a private jet owned by Sheldon Adelson the billionaire casino magnet and supporter of Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Donald Trump. He was greeted on the tarmac at Tel Aviv airport by Netanyahu, who handed him an Israeli ID card. No doubt Pollard and his wife will be treated like royalty in Israel. Here's another man, an Israeli. His name is Mordecai Vanunu. He worked in a secret, secret nuclear bomb factory in Israel in the 80s, but increasingly had pangs of conscience. He was basically fired for his political ideas, but before he left, he quietly took photos of the facility. Eventually, he gave the photos to the Sunday Times of Great Britain and told the newspaper what the photos showed. Before they were published, he was kidnapped by the Israelis and taken to Israel. Vanuna was convicted of treason and espionage and served 18 years, mostly in solitary confinement. He remains in Israel, forbidden to leave the country 
and forbidden to talk to the foreign media. Look at what each of them helped. Pollard gave help to Israeli apartheid, a state which had betrayed Jews of other countries time and time again, and which started the nuclear arms race in the Middle East. Vanunu gave proof to the public of what experts had long suspected, that Israel had a nuclear arms arsenal, and that it was violating the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Vanunu exposed the truth about another government encouraging the worldwide march to omnicide. He probably helped anti-nuclear activists in their successful effort for an international treaty in which, so far, 50 nations have agreed to ban permanently the use or possession of nuclear weapons. Speaking of the treaty, it goes into force on January 22nd. Neither the Trump Republicans nor Biden Democrats have proposed that the U.S. join it. A decision in the Israeli military trial of Issa Amro is expected soon. He's been active in youth against the settlements. The conviction rate in these so-called trials is reportedly above 95 percent. This is an Amnesty International article calling for dismissal of charges against AMRO. It was printed in 2019. Before we leave Palestine, Israel, a note about a glaring example of the apartheid there, shown by this Washington Post headline. A massive inoculation program is taking place for those with Israeli citizenship. About one in six have already gotten the vaccine. But there are millions of Palestinians who are undocumented, with no citizenship. These are the Palestinians of the West Bank and Gaza that Israel pretends are not under Israeli control. They will have to wait months. And then there's the matter of the security prisoners. Now, news about the kingdom ruled by the Saudi family. Women's rights advocate Lujain Al-Hathlul has been sentenced to five years and eight months in prison 
the charges were agitating for change, perusing a foreign agenda, and using the internet to harm public order. These absurd charges are considered terrorism in Saudi Arabia, and she'll now be branded a terrorist. Yet she may get out in two months, because everything is arbitrary in this kingdom ruled by a king and his son, Prince Salman. For more on this, see the website SaudiUS.org. In other news, Dr. Mohammed al Qatani has been on hunger strike for over 10 days. He's a nationally known, imprisoned Saudi leader and dissident. The Saudi-U.S. war on Yemen continues to rip its bloody gash. There's a call for a worldwide action on Monday, January 25th. More about this at SaudiUS.org. Monday, January 15th marks one year since the killing by a state trooper of Mubarak Solomon in West Haven. A vigil is planned at the killing site on Campbell Avenue. Solomon was suspected of a crime and was chased by state police off I-95 and onto that main West Haven street. Back last February, I did a very close analysis of what then happened based on video that came from state trooper body cam. Here it is. Here's the car Soleiman was driving. Notice the timestamp 170437. So that's 5 p.m., 4 minutes, and 37 seconds. Five seconds later, the car was under I-95 where it hit a parked car and stopped. Six seconds later, it was surrounded by state and city police cars. Within seconds, an officer demanded Soleimane get out of the car. 25 seconds later, a state trooper is calling for Soleimane to be shot with a taser. You see, he's pointing to his taser. Nine seconds later, that trooper shoots Mubarak Soleimane seven times. From the time the car was surrounded until the time the trooper shot was around 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Now, what was going on on the other side of the car? For that, we rely on CNN's broadcast of trooper body cam footage that unfortunately does not have a timestamp. Here's that picture you saw before, 55 seconds in on this CNN compilation. Eight seconds later, on the passenger side, a policeman or trooper starts banging on a window with his hand or an object. Eight seconds after that, he starts using a baton to smash the window. The video goes back to the driver's side three seconds later. Five seconds after that, the baton succeeds in smashing the window. Five seconds later, the trooper starts shooting. So here's what we can make out. The car Soleiman was driving was completely surrounded. The windows were up. He had no place to go. The police certainly could have talked to him and waited him out. Police began smashing the car window a bit over 16 seconds after surrounding the car. Around 13 seconds later, an officer shoots Soleimane seven times. The killing was an outrage, but to this day, not one Connecticut politician has criticized any trooper or member of the West Haven police for their involvement. Not Governor Ned Lamont, who nominally controls the state troopers, 
nor Mayor Nancy Rossi of West Haven, nor local state reps or state senators, nor members of the city council. Just silence. Let me remind you that when George Floyd was killed, the mayor of Minneapolis immediately condemned the act and very soon called for the arrest of the members of his police department involved in the action. In Connecticut, nothing. Please attend the vigil if you can. It starts at 4 p.m. on Campbell Avenue in West Haven, just near the highway overpass. If you use GPS, type in 820 Campbell Avenue. It's being sponsored by the Face Group, Facebook Group, Justice for Mubarak. I spoke earlier about the lack of vaccine for undocumented Palestinians. It's part of a larger problem of lack of access for those made part of the lower ranks of world society. A report now from Democracy Now! This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As the United States, Britain and other nations begin unprecedented mass vaccination campaigns to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, other parts of the world may not have access to vaccines for months, if not years. A new report finds as many as nine out of 10 people in dozens of poorer countries could miss out on the coronavirus vaccine until at least 2022, because wealthy countries, including the United States, are hoarding enough doses to vaccinate their entire populations between three and five times over. The report was issued by the people People's Vaccine Alliance, which includes Amnesty International, Frontline AIDS, Global Justice Now, and Oxfam. This is Winifred Bayanima, executive director of UN AIDS, in a video produced by the People's Vaccine Alliance. Huge pharmaceutical companies are keeping the vaccine research a secret. They're deciding how many vaccines get made, how much to charge for them, and who gets vaccinated. This will no doubt leave billions of people behind. Pharma companies are putting profit, not people, first. Yet, billions of dollars of taxpayers' money is funding their work. We cannot let the CEOs of a handful of pharmaceutical companies decide our future. We need a vaccine that everyone can have free of charge, no matter where you live or whether you're rich or you're poor. We need companies to share all their research so we can make enough safe vaccines for everyone. We need a vaccine owned by all of us. To end this COVID-19 pandemic, we need to pull together once more. That was the UN AIDS executive director, part of the People's Vaccine Alliance. The World Health Organization has also warned about the inequitable distribution of the vaccine. This is WHO Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus. We simply cannot accept a world in which the poor and marginalized are trampled by the rich and powerful in the stampede for vaccines. This is a global crisis, and the solutions must be shared equitably as global public goods, not as private commodities that widen inequalities. In early December, Democracy Now!'s Juan Gonzalez and I spoke to two guests about the calls for a people's vaccine. Dr. Moga Kamal Yane, 
joined us from Oxford, England. She's policy advisor to the People's Vaccine Alliance. She worked for decades on access to medicines and health care in developing countries. And Acho Prabla joined us from Bangalore, India, where he's coordinator of the Access IPSA project, which campaigns for access to medicines in IPSA, that's India, Brazil, and South Africa. He recently co-authored an op-ed published in The New York Times headlined, Want Vaccines Fast? Suspend Intellectual Property Rights. I asked Dr. Moga Kamelyane to talk about the call for a people's vaccine. Well, the People's Vaccine is a coalition of um, organizations like uh, Amnesty, Frontline AIDS, Global Justice, Oxfam. It's co-led uh, by Oxfam and, and UNAIDS, and it, it, it has so many people, um, um, you know, academics, health activists, health experts, NGOs, um, uh, uh, patient groups from all over the world, united for one aim, which has a people's vaccine, not a profit vaccine. So we want a vaccine. Basically, we're calling for vaccination that, uh, you know, that is available for all people at risk and then for everybody once we have enough doses. But not the way it's happening now, where if you happen to be born in a rich country, you get the vaccine. If you happen to be born in, in a poor country, you don't. And I mean, yesterday in, in the UK, they started vaccinating um, older people, and there was some clapping, and, and, you know, it was a lot of joy. And of course, that's brilliant, you know, that there is hope that this this problem that we're all suffering from will will be um, you know like there's, there's a light at the end of the tunnel however that joy is only limited to people living here i've got friends and and relatives and people that i work with in other countries in developing countries who are saying yeah and what about us and yeah what about them so this this is really a big problem. There's just so many. It's kind of dividing the world between those who have and can pay and who, those who don't and can't pay. And therefore, well, you can stand in the back of the queue. We don't know when you can get the vaccine. And that is just not right. It's not right on moral grounds. It's not right on public health grounds because everybody's saying nobody's safe until everybody's safe. Yeah, OK. How do you make everybody safe? So a vaccine nationalism will not get you to everybody safe. And also on economic ground, is not you're not going to get the economy growing if just one or back to normal, if one country vaccinates its population and the rest of the world isn't. You can't um, trade with people who are sick or pe or people who have a, you know high high level of infection. So what you know it's, it's, it just doesn't make sense at all. The other important point is that this is not kind of fact of life that, oh, we have limited amount of vaccines. Actually, that's not, that's not the case. There are other options that will uh, enable the world to produce more vaccines and therefore vaccinate more people. So basically what's happening now, if you can imagine that we have a small pie, so that's one vaccine, a small pie. And so basically the rich can have the bigger share of it. And then we'll have just crumbs left for developing countries. While the idea is well, that, well, why don't we increase the pie so everybody can have a decent share of it rather than fighting on a, uh, for, on a little, uh, little one? Well, Dr. Kamaljani, I wanted to ask you about the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine and how access to that vaccine may be more equitable uh, uh, at this stage. Could you talk about some of the agreements that the uh, AstraZeneca has reached with the Coalition for uh, uh, Epidemic Preparedness Innovations and Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance? Well, basically, I mean, th this vaccine has been developed by Oxford University. Oxford University had a standard on managing uh, intellectual property, and it actually talks about open license. However, when they did the, the, the deal or the contract with AstraZeneca, it became exclusive license for AstraZeneca. But they managed to put some conditions in the contract about making the vaccine accessible to developing countries. So AstraZeneca went to one of the big vaccine producers in India 
um, uh, the Serum Institute and uh, made an agreement to produce one billion doses. So that's vaccinating 500 million people. Half of them will be in India. So um, it's a good, good, uh, good way, you know, good start to make more vaccines available. They also, AstraZeneca also has some agreements with other countries, like with Argentina and Brazil. So that uh, may cover um, a number of people in in Latin America. But what about the rest of the population? There's some other deals with countries, but not production uh, as such. You know, you can't leave, it, you know, so AstraZeneca compared to others, yes, they do, they've done um, uh, good things and also fixing the price as, um, uh, well, four AstraZeneca said $4 per dose and Serum said $3 per dose. So for developing countries, it will be probably $3 for, for per dose, so six per course or per person. Um, but the thing is, you can't leave, this is the whole thing, you can't leave the decision on supply, price, uh, which country, which patient, to companies. That's not their job. Their job is to produce. And the job of, of, of governments is to make more production. So you have to um, enable other producers, like in India, there's other producers, other countries would have other producers. So if you allow technology transfer, so sharing technology, which the technology, by the way, a lot of it has been developed by public money, including from the US and the UK and Europe and other countries. So allowing the sharing of technology and removing the intellectual property ba barrier, so no patents on, on vaccines, then other companies can produce the vaccine and we have more. And just like AstraZeneca did this uh, contract with Serum that includes presumably technology transfer or some technology transfer, um, that can be done on a multilateral level, on a bigger level for more companies. Because all these, these deals, by the way, they're all secret. You don't know what's in it except what they announce. Rather than if you have a, a multilateral agreement, you don't, you know, the, the negotiation happens in, in, in closed doors. But then once they agree a license, then it's public. Then you see what's good and what's bad about it. For the full Democracy Now! segment, go to YouTube. Look up Democracy Now! and look on video for January 1st, 2021. That's our program for today. See you next week at this time. Stay safe, folks, but stay active. I'm Stanley Heller for The Struggle.